I would like to share God's grace today with a sermon entitled, Pilot Who Moved Back and Forth. So every Lord's Day, we confess our faith using Apostles' Creed, or we can say Confession of Faith. Right? The Apostles' Creed means that it's the confession that Apostles made. And Apostles are the people who directly related, who live the same time with Jesus Christ. Right? So their faith, confession, their faith must be uh, more uh, or, or original and more uh, fundamental than uh, those who lived uh, far away from Jesus, right? So Apostles' Creed, how the Apostles uh, confessed about Jesus Christ, about, uh, about God, about Holy Spirit, about faith, right? That's we are using as to confess every Lord's Day, as our confession, right? So confession of faith. And among them, among this confession of, within the confession of faith, there is this line, isn't it? Suffer, Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. Right? Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. So we repeatedly confess and be reminded that Jesus was suffering under Pontius Pilate. As such, Pilate is as famous as Jesus for the believers of the Christ, isn't it? Because we at least confess once a week. Uh, and the, the contents is about Jesus suffering under Pontius Pilate. So what did he do? That what, wherever the gospel of Jesus goes, wherever the church goes, that his name also be made known and be blamed for delivering our Jesus. And this is what we are going to think about it today, right? So when it comes to the time of Jesus, there are so many people in charge in the Israeli area or in the Palestine area. So let's think about who they were and what kind of relationship they had to each other, right? There were, uh, there were king, there, there was a governor, there was a uh, tetrarch, and there was a Sanhedrin, there was a religious leader, there was a high priest, right? Mm. So let's think about these people who were in power, who were in charge, who were in position, right? So thing number one is people in charge in the time of Jesus Christ. People in charge in the time of Jesus Christ. If, uh, if we just go back a little further, so if we th th uh, start talking about the destruction of southern Judah, right? The southern Judah was destroyed by Babylon in uh, 5 A6 BC, right? Afterward, the hegemony of the world moves to, as you know, to Persia, right? And to ancient Greece. After Alexander the Great conquered the world, he died suddenly without an heir, as you know. So his four servants, his four generals, became a regional king by dividing the empire into four different sections. Well, in the, in the, initially there were more generals and more people who, uh, called themselves as a regional king, but in the end, it uh, settled down with the four, di uh, four uh, generals and four districts in, in general. So let's say that there were four sections and four uh, different uh, kings. Regarding the Israeli area, in the Palestine area, it was on the Ptolemaic Empire. Ptolemaic Empire was uh, in charge of Egypt and this, the, the peninsula of Sinai, right? Sinai. Yet, uh, Seleucid Empire, they were, uh, they were the, the servants of this Alexander, right? So we consider that time still as ancient Greece, right? Ancient Greece. So Seleuc Seleucid Empire, uh, as you can see on the screen, right? Uh, they were in charge of this uh, Mesopotamian area, right? So which is right above this uh, peninsula of Sinai, right? So Ptolemaic Empire and Seleucid Seleucid Empire, they had this border together at about this uh, peninsula of Sinai or this, uh, the Israeli area or the Palestine area, right? So what happened is Seleuc Seleucid Empire took it, took the, the Israeli area or the Palestine area from the Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic Empire by force. So 
you know that uh, they were still under ancient Greece, but uh, they were they there were some wars and battles to uh, have more right the the territory and have more power among them right among themselves. So it was the the land of Canaan, right? The Israel area uh, initially belonged to the Ptolemaic Empire, but it was changed to Seleucid Selus Empire. Then, in about 164 BC, the Maccabees, Maccabees of the Jews, successfully revolted against the Seleucid Empire and gained autonomy. Right? They uh, became independent. Right? They became independent. For about next 70 years, so this Maccabees is called the Hashemonian dynasty, right? Hashemonian dynasty. The Hashemonian dynasty ruled over Israeli area. And during this time, they conquer the area of Idumea and convert them to Judaism. Right. I mean, this story will be uh, part of the history of Redemption 6 series, book 5 and 6. And I'm sure that uh, when it comes to that time, we will study the history uh, more in more detail. But let's just think the in the in the in the big picture of a ancient Greece, the 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 land of Canaan, right, was ruled over by Ptolemaic Empire and then Seleucid, Seleucid Empire. Then it was it became independent. So Hashemonian dynasty of the Jews uh, ruled over, right. And at that time, this Hashemonian uh, dynasty, these people, right, really had the idea of, uh, of, of uh, recovering and restoring the full land of Canaan, the full territory of the land of Canaan. So they started enlarging their territory as well. So uh, one of the reasons, one of the districts that was conquered during this time was the region of Idumea, Idumea, right? This is the southern part of uh, of of uh, uh, the Israel at the time, and when new powerful hegemony, Roman Empire, right? Roman Empire is the next uh, powerful hegemony, right? So when new uh, powerful hegemony, Roman Empire rose, General Pompey or Pompeius, Pompey, one of the uh, triumvirs. As you know, in the beginning of the Roman Empire, there were they had these triumvirs, right? They had these three leaders at the same time. So one of the triumvirs came to conquer the Israeli area. Then, as the Idumean Antifa, the Idumean whose name is Antifa, sorry, Antipater. Ah, oh, let's go. Here you go, right? Ah, oh. so the first person here, right? Antipater, uh, the Idumean. The name Antipater supported and helped Pompey. So he was appointed as the governor of the Israeli area, right? However, when, uh, when this uh, Antipater, right, when he was killed and when Pompey was also killed in Rome, right, the Hashemonian people tried to take back the throne. So, you, you, you know, you know the, this power flow and power game, right? Although they were, uh, they lost their position and they were conquered, but they were not entirely, uh, not annihilated from the earth, of the, the face of the earth, right? So there are still the Seleucid, uh, descendants. There are still the Ptolemaic descendants. And there are still the Hashemonian people, right? So after Idumean, Antipater took over the Israeli area. When he died, right, the Hashemonian uh, dynasty, the Hashemonian people tried to take back the land or the leadership or the uh, governing authority, right? Thus, Herod the Great, Herod the Great. Uh, Herod the Great is the one who ordered to kill all the babies when he heard about the birth of Jesus Christ, right? So Herod the Great escaped Rome, escaped Rome and there, he was appointed as a king over Judea by Antonius, one of the second triumvirs. So, if I show you the picture, can we see? It? No, we cannot see it. 
sorry. Right here, go. Uh, so the Herod, Herod the Great, right, was appointed by this Roman Empire or the Roman Triumvirs, right, the the Antonius, and he became the king of Judea, right, and then he came back to, of course, the Israel area. Then he was the one. Who rule over the land of Canaan, we can say, or, or the Palestine area, or Israeli area. However, after his death, uh, he had uh, three sons. You can see on the screen the Herod, uh, Archelaus, and Herod Philip II, Herod Antipas. Herod Archelaus, well, they, they, they all became the Tetrarch. Tetrarch. Tetrarch is a king but who is under Roman Empire, right? Or the regional king that is uh, submitting themselves to Roman Empire, right? That's the Tetrarch. So uh, Herod Archelaus became uh, the Tetrarch uh, over Judea and Samaria. So that's the central place, isn't it? So Herod Archelaus. You can see on the screen, Judea and Samaria, right? And then Herod Philip II, Herod Philip II, he became the uh, uh, Tetrarch who is in charge of Etraia and Trachonitis. You cannot see them on the on the map, but if you look at on the on the top side, northern side, there is called Caesarea Philippi, right? Caesarea Philippi. That's the city that uh, the Herod Philip uh, renovated and named. Uh, as a uh, Caesarea, which is Caesar's Philip, right? So this is the place. This is the place where this Herod Philip II was uh, being a Tetrarch uh, over, right? And then third was the Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas, and Her Herod Antipas, uh, he was he he was the Tetrarch in charge of Galilee. You can see Galilee there, right? Yellow color and Perea which is a green color on the east of the Jordan, right? So Galilee and Perea, he was in charge of these places. Right. But what happened is, Herod Archelaus, who was in charge of Judea and Samaria, he had this great uh, hope and vision that he would like to become a great king like the Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great conquered the entire land, isn't it? All the world that he could reach. So this uh, Herod Achelaus had his vision that he wanna, he wanna become a, a king like, a great king like Alexander, and, and he tried to conquer all the land and convert them, make them Judaism, Judaism, Judaism country, the entire country, entire land, all the world as a Judaism country. So what happened? He tried to uh, make a war, and he tried to revolt, right? Therefore, he wasn't uh, pleased uh, by Roman Empire. So he was taken out from his position. So Jude Judea, Judea and Samaria, there was no tetrarch, there was no king. So what happened? Roman Empire sent a governor, right? Roman governor to rule over this Judea and Samaria, right? So there are, there are many governors who were appointed to be a governor of this area, and one of them was Pontius Pilate, right? Pontius Pilate was the governor over this Judea and Samaria, right? Judea and Samaria. So hopefully, uh, this un uh, allows you to understand why in the, in the last week of Jesus Christ, there were, you know, so many different people, right? And that there were so many different uh, people in charge. So if we look at Luke chapter 3, verse uh, 1 to 2, it says, Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. So the, the emperor's name is Tiberius now, right? 
in Roman Empire. When Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, see, he was the governor over Judea and Samaria, right, but Judea, and Herod was tetrarch over Galilee. This one is Herod Antipas, right, the tetrarch of Galilee and Perea. And his brother Philip was a tetrarch of reign of Etraia and Trachonitis. We said that he is in, in charge of the northern area, right? And Risanius was tetrarch of Abilene. Uh, he is not from uh, the Herod's family. He is actually the descendant of Seleucid Empire, right? So he was even, uh, he was, he was, he was located even northern part than this Caesarea Philippi, right? He was way over a northern area. So he's, his territory is not in the map, right? In the high priesthood uh, of Annas and Caiaphas, as you know, there were two high priests uh, living at the same time. It was impossible, but because the corruption of the religious uh, religion, that there were two uh, high priests, right? The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. So hopefully that you can understand this, the hegemony and the power uh, dynamic in the time of Jesus Christ. Right, so I will switch off. Right. So now, secondly, Pilate compromised. Pilate compromised. Jesus was caught by the religious leaders at the Garden of Gethsemane because of the traitorousness of Judas Iscariot, right? Because Judas Iscariot betrayed that Jesus was caught, right? And this time, the religious leaders bribed the people and asked to bring a false testimony to Jesus Christ. But according to the law, in order for such testimony to be taken as a lawful evidence, uh, at least two must testify the same. However, the Bible says their, their false testifies were not consistent. So if you look at Mark chapter 14, verse 55 to 56, it says, Now the chief priests and under the whole council kept trying to obtain testimony against Jesus to put him to death, right? They were looking for, they were uh, trying to gain this, the testimony, right? The, the testimony that can uh, put death penalty upon Jesus Christ. And then Bible says, and they were finding any, right? They were not finding any, right? For many were giving false testimony against him, yet their testimony was not consistent, right? Their, their uh, witnesses and their accusation were not matching each other. So uh, the, none of them could be taken as a lawful evidence against Jesus Christ. So Caiaphas asked Jesus, the Caiaphas, the Annas is the former high priest, but who's still living, right? According to the uh, Jewish, cult, Jewish law, that only when the high priest, the previous or the, uh, the, the current high priest dies, then the successor can be uh, appointed. But uh, at that time, there were two. So Annas was the former high priest, but he was still in uh, power. He was still uh, influencing people, right? And then Caiaphas was the current uh, high priest. So Jesus was brought to the Annas, house of Annas first, and uh, the high priest Annas inter inter the asked him, but he couldn't find the uh, right or the, the, the good enough accusation. So he sent Jesus Christ to Caiaphas. So Caiaphas asked Jesus, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus answered, you're right. Therefore, Caiaphas uh, announced that Jesus deserved death because of blasphemy. That is recorded in Matthew chapter 26, verse 63 to 66. It's not on the screen. Matthew chapter 26, verse 63 to 66. So do you know what, what was happening? Because these Annas and Caiaphas could not find any uh, lawful evidence, lawful testimony against Jesus Christ. So he asked, are you the 
Son of God, are you the Christ? And Jesus said, yes, I am, right? And immediately he said, right, he, that, that is the sure sign of blasphemy. So what, what, what other evidences do we need to put him to death? Right. And he asked people, and there in the, in the house of Caiaphas, all the Sanerin, uh, the members, and all these religious leaders were there, already decide to put Jesus to death. Right? So they all agree, we don't need any lawful evidences. Right? And that's blasphemy, that's enough. Right? Let's put him to death. However, there was... No lawful authority to decide life or death in Sennacherib or in the high priest. Thus, they brought Jesus to Pilate. Right, as I said, this the 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 Israel area. Right, they were still under Roman Empire's governing. Right, they were given this uh, autonomy. Right, so that they can rule over, they can decide for themselves, they can run for themselves, but they were still under uh, the great power of Roman Empire. So uh, this Sanhedrin and the high priest, they did not have any authority to put someone to death. So they decided that he, is, he deserved death, and he brought Jesus Christ to Pilate, uh, so that the Pilate, the Roman governing body, can announce the sentence of death. Upon Jesus Christ. However, now it's up to Pilate, isn't it? So small number one is Pilate knew Jesus was innocent. Pilate knew Jesus was innocent. In front of Pilate, the people accused Jesus, saying that Jesus misled the people and forbid to pay taxes to Caesar, right? All the, all, all kinds of things. However, as their testimonies were not consistent, we, we read, read about it from the Bible, right? Their false accusation were not consistent, right? So Pilate must have immediately noticed that they charge against Jesus with a false accusation, right? Ah, that must be, it's, it's, it's wrong, right? There is no lawful evidence against Jesus Christ. He must have known already, right? So Pilate said that Luke chapter 23 verse 4, I find no guilt in this man, right? I find no guilt in this man. So the, right? You, you are following this, uh, the scenario, right? You are following this uh, movie at the moment, right? So the Jesus was brought to Pilate and Pilate immediately knew that no, this is wrong, right? So he said, I find no guilt in this man. Then uh, he heard that Jesus was from Galilee, right? Jesus was from Galilee, right? So he sent Jesus to Herod. You remember the picture, the map, right? Herod Antipas was the tetrarch over Galilee and Perea, right? And the... Uh, the Pontius Pilate was the governor over Judea and Samaria. Jerusalem is in Ju Ju Judea, right? However, the, the birthplace of Jesus Christ belonged to Galilee, right? Galilee. Nazareth, Galilee, right? So the, 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 the Pontius Pilate thought, oh, if he was born from Galilee, right, that he should be judged, right? He should be, uh, he sh the jurisdic jurisdiction should be under this Herod Antipas. So uh, it was the uh, by chance that Herod Antipas was in Jerusalem, right? Herod Antipas was in Jerusalem, so he sent uh, this Jesus to Herod Antipas. Right. So that is written in Luke chapter twenty-three, verse six. Uh, six to seven, it says. But when he, when Pilate heard it, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to the Herod's jur uh, jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, to himself also was in Jerusalem at that time. See, right? So he sent to Herod. But Herod Antipas also didn't find any guilt, so he sent him back to Pilate, right? So Pilate said, I have not found anything that deserves the death penalty. So 
He said, the pilot said, I will just release him uh, by punishing him. That is written in Luke chapter 23, verse 15 to 16. Luke chapter 23, verse 15 to 16. Nor, uh, nor has Herod. So Herod, I sent to Herod, but Herod sent, me, sent, sent him back to me, which means he has found nothing wrong with the Jesus Christ. So nor has, has Herod, for he sent him back to us. And behold, nothing deserving death has been done by him. I will therefore punish him and release him. Right? He doesn't deserve any death. Right? He doesn't deserve the death penalty. Maybe he caused any, uh, some trouble, so I will just punish him, right? beat him, and I will release him. So if I list what Pilate said about Jesus is like below. The first is, I find no guilt in him. Luke chapter 23, verse 4, and John chapter 18, verse 38, right? The pilot said, I find no guilt in Jesus Christ, right? Secondly, he said, nothing deserving death has been done by him. Luke chapter 23, verse 15. Luke chapter 23, verse 15. Also, uh, thirdly, I have found... Uh, in him, no guilt demanding death. John chapter 19, verse 4, and Luke chapter 23, verse 22. John chapter 19, verse 4, and Luke chapter 23, verse 22. Addition to this, if you look at uh, Matthew chapter 27, verse 19, Matthew chapter 27, verse 19, he says, And while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him, saying, Have nothing to do with the, that righteous man. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. So the wife of Pilate, right, sent the message that he is innocent, right? So do not do anything unjustly uh, to him, because I had a, I had a, you know, great suffer last night in the during the during the night, right? And the Mark chapter fifteen verse ten, Mark chapter fifteen verse ten, he said. For he uh, refers to Pilate, right? Pilate was aware that the chief priest had delivered him, Jesus, right, uh, up because of envy, right? So Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent. Pilate knew, and Pilate was confirmed by the wife, his wife, that you know this is something that he shouldn't do, right? He shouldn't do anything unjust upon Jesus Christ. Right? And he knew that it is all, it, it happened because these high priests and the religious leaders, uh, were envious of Jesus Christ, right? Envious. It was done by because of envy. Having examined all above, it is clear that Pilate knew there is no guilt in Jesus, right? Pilate knew it clearly, and perhaps Pilate believed that Jesus has no sin. Jesus is innocent, right? There is no uh, wrong and there is no guilt. There is no sin that demands death uh, to Jesus Christ. So that's his position, right? He knew the truth, that Jesus is innocent, right? Secondly, however, Pilate pronounced death upon Jesus. Pilate pronounced uh, death upon Jesus. Luke chapter 23, verse 24 to 25. It says, And Pilate pronounced sentence that their demand should be granted. Granted, And he released the man that they were asking for who had been thrown into prison for uh, insurrection and murder, but he delivered Jesus to their will. Despite that Pilate knew Jesus was innocent, he ended up senten sentencing, sentencing death's upon Jesus. Then what changed his mind? He was 100% sure, right? He was 100%, maybe more than 100%, 120%, maybe 200%, right? He was so sure that Jesus was innocent. He tried everything, right? He sent to, you know, he consulted with everyone that he could have ever consulted with, right? And he was so sure that, no, Jesus has no guilt that demands uh, deserve death. However, what changed his mind? Here you go. The answer is here. John chapter 19, verse 12. John chapter 19, verse 12. As a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him. Right? Pilate really made a great effort to release Jesus Christ. 
But the Jews cried out, saying, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. So what happened is the Jews, the religious leaders, uh, blackmailed Pilate, saying, If you release Jesus, we will report to Caesar that you are not doing your job well, and you are working against the Caesar. If it happened, he may, the pilot may be sacked from the governor's office. Pilot could, might uh, lose his job, right? And if you look at Luke chapter 23, verse 23, it says, at the end of it, it says, their voices, the voice of the Jews, the voice of the religious leaders prevailed, right? Prevail what? Prevail the truth that the pilot had, the de decision that pilot made. Right, the voices of the Judas, the voice, sorry, the voices of the religious leaders, right, prevailed. The truth that the pilot had. So, in one hand, he was so sure that Jesus was innocent, but because of this blackmail, because of this threat, right, he ended up on the. On the other extreme, uh, sentencing death upon Jesus Christ. Then, will there be any clue, right? How can that dramatic changes, right, a change happen so easily, right? He was on this extreme that Jesus is innocent, right? And he tried everything to release him. And on the other hand, right, he sentenced death upon Jesus Christ. How can he move from one extreme to the other extreme? So that easily, right? Or that quickly. Is there any clue that he, uh, why that kind of dramatic or why that kind of 180 degree changes, right? Why there, why, uh, there was this, uh, the dramatic change from heaven to earth, right? Uh, being made in Pilate. Apostle John recorded about Pilate moving back and forth, moving back and forth. In the book of John, right, that the Apostle John recorded about his, uh, his moving out from his praetorium and his moving back to his office and his coming out from his praetorium and his coming back, right? His, this moving forth and back is recorded in the book of uh, John in detail. Right? Although the pilot physically moved back and forth several times from his praetorium and to the Jews outside, but it can also, according to the founding pastor, it can also signify his heart is being swayed. His heart, his determination, his, uh, he was being swayed. He was spiritually also moving uh, back and forth. Right? So let's look at this uh, instance. First, you can say you can see that Pilate went out to them. John chapter eighteen verse twenty nine. John chapter eighteen verse twenty nine. It says, Pilate therefore went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? So the Pilate went out to see the Jews. Right. The second is Pilate entered again into the praetorium. John chapter 18, verse 33. It says, Pilate therefore entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Then third is the Pilate went out again to the Jews. John chapter 18, verse 38. It says, Pilate said to him, What is truth? And he had said this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him. Right? And then fourth is, Pilate came out again. John chapter 19, verse 4. Pilate came out again. Out again. It says, And Pilate came out again and said to him, said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. Right? And the fifth is, Pilate entered into the praetorium again. John chapter 19, verse 9. And he entered into the praetorium again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. And then sixth is Pilate brought Jesus out. John chapter 19, verse 13. 
When Pilate therefore heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. As I said, the actual reason why Pilate had to move back and forth was because the religious leaders refused to go into the praetorium, worrying that they might get defiled by the by touching leavens in the praetorium. You know that in the time of the last week of uh, Jesus on earth was the time of Passover, time of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, right? So uh, from about 10th of Nisan, right? From about uh, within that week, right? They clean their houses and they clean everything. Mm. And the, the day that when Jesus died on the cross, right? So this day when they uh, went to see Pilate, right? That was the day they should go later on, later at the evening, right? And, and eat the Passover lamb. Mm. So that is the day that they Make sure there are no leavens, right? They've been make sure and they've been cleansing and they've been washing and they've been, they've been doing everything that they will not be touched uh, by the leavens. But this is the day that there will be make sure that no leavens uh, to, be, to be found around them or in them, right? So because this is a, a Roman praetorium, right? Certainly the, the pilot would not cleanse would not would not would, would have not cleansed their places uh, from leavens because the Passover is not their culture, right? So the religious leaders and high priests, all the Jews, they refused to go into the praetorium. They worried they might they might get defiled. So that was the actually physical reason why the Pilate had to come out to talk to the, the religious leader and he went in and come out and went in. And come out and went in. However, the founding pastor uh, ex- uh, the, the, uh, explained that although there might be physical movement, right, physical moving back and forth, it signifies, it can also represent his spiritual moving, right? His heart was being swayed. Do I, do I do this or do I have to do this or do I have to do, do that, right? He was juggling between to pursue the, pursue the truth and to please the people outside, right? He knew immediately, almost in the beginning, that he knew that Jesus is innocent, right? So he was juggling between, he was being swayed, he was in dilemma of whether to, whether to approve that Jesus is innocent or to please the people outside. So, in, their, in his heart, there was this uh, being swayed. There was this uh, uh, fro and to, right? There was this moving back and forth already. He was being swayed. Because of that, when the threat comes, when the threat came to him that we will report to the seizure and you will lose your job, that became too big and too scary, too frightening that he cannot overcome. That he uh, forfeit, he forfeit the truth that he was pursuing, right? Because of this, because he was moving back and forth, because there was no steadfastness in his heart, that he ended up delivering out, delivering Jesus to the hands uh, or, or to, to death, right? To death. So, conclusion for today. Coming back to the first question, what is the true reason that we have to be reminded about Pilate every time we make the confession of faith? What is the, what is the, what is the true reason? Is it to blame him? Is it to remember that, oh, there was a name, there was a person named Pilate, Pontius Pilate, right? He was so evil, that he delivered Jesus Christ to the hands of the Jews to be crucified, is it? So that every time we recite and every time we confess our faith, that we remember, oh, there was an evil guy whose name is Pilate. Is it the reason? 
Is it to curse pilot gener uh, pilot generation after generation? I don't believe so. The founding pastor said that we should be able to see ourselves through pilot. Pilot is not someone else. Pilot is us. Pilot is ourselves. Pilot is us. Whenever we uh, do co the confession of faith, we should be able to examine ourselves whether we are not like Pilate today, whether we are not whether we are not being swayed in between God's word and the words of the people, right? Whether we are not being swayed by the news or the or the faith of God, faith in God and the, and the, and the gossip of the of the word, right? That is a true reason why we have to uh, recall Pilate every, every Lord's Day when we confess our faith. To examine our hearts, to examine our lives. Did I, was there, had, had, had been there, the steadfastness of faith in me the last week, during the last week? Do I have this steadfastness? Do I have this faithfulness? Or am I being swayed like, uh, Pilot, if there is any, uh, if we are if, if we are being swayed, right, then we may end up like Pilot. We know what is true, right? We know what is the word of God. We know what is right. Yet we could end up doing that is uh, completely opposite to what we know, right? Knowing is one thing, but doing it, uh, the uh, behaving, acting according to it is another thing, right? Pilate had understood the truth. He had the truth, but he didn't act according to it, doesn't it? So in the same way, we have to examine ourselves, whether we are not like Pilate today. For example, at one moment, we know that we should come close to the word of God and prayer. But next moment, we are too busy, too busy taking care of our daily life. I'm not saying taking, take, taking care of our business and our daily life is a bad thing, right? But we know what we need to do. What, we know what we should do, right? But if we forget and if we become lazy, if we kind of taking a distance apart from what we should do, what we know, the truth, right? That is being swayed, isn't it? At one moment, we know that the tribulation is God's blessing, but next moment, we started worrying about it. That is the life moving back and forth and being swayed. Then how can we stop being swayed? How can we not move back and forth? How can we? Right? I mean, because we want, we want to stop, right? We want to have this steadfastness. We want to have this faithfulness. How can we do it? There is no way. That's the answer. As a human being, we cannot do it. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, no, there is no way. Romans chapter 3 verse 10, right? Romans chapter 3 verse 10 is now on the screen. It says that uh, there is no one righteous, not even one. That's what the Bible says, isn't it? After the fall, all the human beings, doesn't matter who that is, right? There is a little difference of this, how, you know, how good that person is, how bad that person is, how godly he may seem like, she may seem like, and uh, how ungodly. However, in the eyes of God, there is no one righteous. There is no one righteous. So we are just, we are being swayed just like Pilate, isn't it? And there is no way that we can overcome it. There is no way that we can stop being swayed. There is no way that we can uh, have this steadfastness according to, by ourselves or according to our ability, right? There is no power. There is no ability uh, in us. However, however, the conclusion, the title of the conclusion is what? By his grave and through his love, right? The founding pastor then explained about the disciples who left Jesus Christ. Disciples who left Jesus Christ at the, uh, the moment of crucifixion, right? When Jesus died, all ran away. All left Jesus Christ. All ran away for their lives, right? 
And although they gather together in the room, right, and shutting down all these doors and windows, right, you know that that is wrong, isn't it? Because Jesus said what? Jesus said, I will go to Galilee before you, right? When I resurrect, when I rise again, I will be in Galilee before you, right? So if they ever believed after this crucifixion, if they ever believed, then where they should be? They should be in Galilee, isn't it? But they were in Jerusalem, in a room, hiding themselves, shutting all the doors and windows. Jesus went to them, isn't it? Jesus went into that room. Peace be with you, right? And he gave the Holy Spirit, breathed into them, right? And received the Holy Spirit. Thomas was not there, right? So Jesus visited them second time, the same place, right? And then still, when they went to the Sea of Tiberias, what happened? The, 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 the Simon Peter said, right? The Peter said, let's go back to our... Uh, you know, the previous occupation, right? Let's go fishing, right? Uh, there is no hope in Jesus Christ, right? So we can see that they were still not believing in Jesus at that time, or until that time. Then Jesus prepared his, uh, the, the you know, fire and the food, the fish, right? And Jesus, uh, you know, made Peter to restore his ministry, right? His faith by asking him about do you love me, right? I mean, I don't have any scripture for that, but that is how Jesus works. Just like the, these disciples of Jesus Christ, we have no hope. Just like Pilate, we have no hope to be, be steadfast and then be firm. We are being swayed all the time. That's the nature of a human being, right? All the people, you named it, everyone in the Bible as well, right? Because that's what the Bible said. No one righteous. There is no one righteous. Even King David, even King Solomon, right? Even Abraham, we saw that Abraham made a, a lot of mistakes in his life, right? Everyone is being swayed, right? But what can make us to uh, come out, overcome from moving back and forth and have this steadfastness in our heart is by and according to the love of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ will come to us and he will reinstate us. He will restore us. He will make us the people beloved by Jesus, right? And he will make us the people who love Jesus Christ. It's not how we do, but it's the love of Jesus Christ. So only through uh, His love, only through the love of Jesus Christ, only through the grace of Jesus Christ, we can overcome being swayed. We can get over this, uh, uh, and we can have this steadfastness in our heart. If you look at John chapter 13, verse 1, John chapter 13, verse 1, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he should depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Isn't it? He loved, Jesus loves us to the end. That's our only hope. Our Father loves us to the end. He will never give up. He will never uh, abandon us, right? And that is our hope. That is our power. That is our weapon. How can we overcome? Not by our might, but because Jesus loves us. Because our Father greatly loves you and me. John chapter 3, verse 16. In the Word, God so loved the Word, right? Uh, greatly loved. He, his love is great, amazing, beyond the measure. And because of that love, we can and we will have this steadfastness of faith in us. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 10. Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse 10, it says, By showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So the love of God, right? It's being shown to generation after generation, not only to me, right? Thousand generations. 
His love has never end, right? His uh, love will never end. So, my brothers and sisters, when uh, in the in the time while we are passing through, while we are going through this time of difficulty, we may wonder why can I not have this you know strong faith that will never be shaken, right? I mean, I went to. <laughs> Sorry, I went to uh, take a vaccine last night, yesterday, and uh, I was scary because uh, I don't know what, I mean, not, I didn't worry about uh, having uh, this uh, great uh, uh, illness or side effect, but I was worried, about if, what if I have a headache? What if I have a body ache? What if I have this pain in my the body that I cannot overcome? So what should I do with this low day service? What if I cannot wake up? What if I cannot stand up? I mean, that's nature, isn't it? It's not I plan to worry, but it kind of comes in uh, naturally. It does. That's human being. And that's just like pilot, isn't it? However, we got to depend on the love of God. God will love us. And God will save us. God will deliver us. God will make us a firm, faithful people. It's not by according to our mind. We got to kneel down, therefore. And we got to humble ourselves before God. We got to cry out to our Father God. That Father help us. There is nothing we can do to make us righteous before you. It's only by your grace. And it's only by your love. And one thing that we know, just like Pilate, in our brain, is that God loves us, isn't it? God loves us. Is there anyone who is questioning, who is doubting that God loves you at the moment, then I will tell you, God loves you. Just like the Bible said, God loves you to the end. God loves you uh, over a thousand generations, right? So there's, there's one thing that we know. God loves us, right? So then now act according to the word of God, right? Let's ask God. Father, save us, deliver us according to your love. Make my face strong, firm in you, Father, so that I don't have, I don't being, I don't, I don't be swayed, right? I don't, I don't move back and forth, right? When we pray like that, when we humbly ask God to help us, I believe we will have that steadfastness. We will have the strong faith, right? We will have the blessing that we will never make a mistake like Pilate. Amen. Amen. May such blessing be upon you uh, today.